Stone Age finds on Kersal Moor and Mowed Wheel, and evidence of a Bronze Age burial mound at Broughton, provide just a tantalising glimpse of the ancient history of the modern city of Salford. At the dawn of the first millennium, this was a sparsely populated part of the kingdom of the Brigantes tribe. The first known settlement in the area was a small Iron Age community known as Mancinian, the place of tents, across the river Irwell at its confluence with the Medlock. The Celtic inhabitants of Mancinian would almost certainly have used a natural ford across the Irwell, and both the ford and the river itself would play a major role in the future development of the region. The start of that process came shortly after the Roman invasion of Britain in 43 AD. To aid the conquest of the north, the Romans built a fort on the site of the ancient British settlement of Mancinium. Soon, a network of roads converged on the site, including a main route to the north which crossed the ancient ford and ran roughly along the line of Berry New Road, through Broughton and on to an important base at Ribchester. As Britain emerged as one of the most peaceful and prosperous provinces of the Roman Empire, grand homes were built on the edge of urban centres, and fragments of plaster unearthed near Albert Park in Lower Broughton suggest that a Roman villa once stood here. The stable existence of its inhabitants, though, was about to be shattered. Early in the 5th century, Rome itself came under threat from barbarian hordes, and troops were recalled from Britain to defend the homeland leaving these shores open to a new breed of invader. Angles, Saxons and Jutes swept across the North Sea, pushing the Romano-British population further and further west into the Celtic fringes of Cornwall and Wales. The name Wales comes from Wales, Anglo-Saxon for foreigners. The newcomers settled their newly won lands and the townships that make up the modern borough were born. The original settlement of Salford lay within a curve of the Irwell and is thought to take its name from the Old English Sal, which means sallow or willow, the ford by the willow. The ton ending indicates a farmstead, as in Swinton, literally, pig farm. Lee means a clearing in the forest. Berry means fortified place, suggesting that Pendlebury was of early importance to the Anglian settlers. Eccles stands out among local place names and is derived from the Celtic word for church. Britain had converted to Christianity during the Roman occupation, but it had largely been swept away by the pagan Anglo-Saxons. In a handful of places, small enclaves of Britons had survived, either as slaves of the newcomers or as independent communities eking out a living in hostile territory. Perhaps this was one such group, keeping alive their culture and religion. If so, this could be one of the oldest continuously Christian sites in England. The Anglo-Saxons eventually converted to Christianity themselves, but a new pagan invader soon loomed on the horizon. Early Viking raids by the late 9th century turned to full-scale invasion and, in 870, a huge Danish and Norse army sacked and pillaged the Salford and Manchester area. Only Alfred the Great of Wessex prevented England from being overrun completely, and it was he and his heirs that led the Saxon recovery. By 920 AD, Salford was back in English hands under Alfred's son, Edward the Elder, who brought the whole of the land between Ribble and Mersey under his sway. Salford was now part of the domain of the kings of Wessex. For taxation purposes, the wider area was divided into six smaller districts, known as hundreds, as each was expected to provide a hundred men-at-arms when required. Tr trouble between Vikings and English effectively ended when William the Conqueror won the crown at the Battle of Hastings in 1066. At the time of the Doomsday Book, 20 years later, the population of the whole hundred of Salford was only about 3,000, of which Salford, Broughton and Pendleton combined accounted for just a few hundred. Although it was of no great economic value, this sparsely populated area was of great political importance 
since it controlled the northwestern extreme of the kingdom. It was therefore either held directly by the king or a related powerful magnate. For that reason, perhaps, the men of Salford appear to have greater privileges than those in other manors. They were not bound to keep the king's manor house in repair, nor to reap his fields at harvest time. The early 12th century brought developments that sowed the seeds of conflict between townships on opposite sides of the Irwell that still exist today. In 1102, Henry I created the Barony of Manchester, which excluded Salford, the first step in a process that would see Manchester eventually overshadow its neighbour. For administrative and taxation purposes, the new manor came within the Salford Hundred, but ecclesiastically, the actual township of Salford became part of the newly created parish of Manchester. Worsley was a small township within the large parish of Eccles. The first reference to it by name came in 1195, when records tell us that Hugh Paltrell gave the manors of Worsley and Holton to Richard, son of Elias de Worksley, for his homage and service. Early in the 13th century, Robert Grelly, 5th Baron of Manchester, built a manor house near to St Mary's Church overlooking the Irwell, and with the lord of the manor now in residence, the town began to expand. Salford was also beginning to emerge as a small town, centred around the Greengate area, and in 1228, Henry III granted a weekly market on Wednesdays and an annual fair on the eve, day and morrow of the Nativity of St Mary, the 7th to the 9th of September. Two years later, Ranulf de Blunderville, Earl of Chester, and at that time Lord of the Manor of Salford, granted another charter making the town a free borough, which added further to the townsfolk's privileges. Some of the most important clauses in the charter were those that permitted the town to elect its own reeve and hold its own council, known as the port moat, made up of prominent burgesses. De Blunderville's charter also excluded the sale of land in the new borough of Salford for religious use. The township, together with Broughton, therefore remained almost entirely highly dependent on the parish church of Manchester. At about the time the charter was granted, a new stone bridge was built on the site of Victoria Bridge and would remain the only one between the two towns for more than 500 years. Changes that would have some significance for the future development of the region were taking place elsewhere. In 1354, Sir John Radcliffe established his right to inherit the manor of Audsall on his return from the French wars and took over an estate of 120 acres of land and 12 acres of wood. The Worsley lands now included large parts of Swinton, Pendlebury, Kersley and much of the extensive Chat Moss. With the failure of the Worsley mail line in 1385, the estate passed first to the masses of Tatton and then to the Brereton's of Malpass. A descendant of Richard Brereton married into the Egerton family, beginning the long association between Worsley, the Egerton's, and the Dukes of Bridgewater, who lived at Worsley Old Hall. Salford's ecclesiastic dependence on Manchester was a continued thorn in its side, and when Henry VIII's historian, John Leyland, came this way in the 1530s, he described the town as only a larger suburb to Manchester, enough to raise the hackles of Salfordians, even today. In fact, in these days when wool and flax were the chief fibres, Salford had its share of leading merchants who traded through London. In the first half of the 16th century, Adam Byram of Salford Hall was considered to be the second richest merchant clothier in Salford Hundred, and later, Lawrence Robinson of Salford was one of the wealthiest clothiers in the county. Meanwhile, the Radcliffes of Audsall had risen to national prominence. Sir Alexander Radcliffe was High Sheriff of Lancashire on four occasions between 1523 and 1548, and a member of nearly every generation was knighted for his prowess in the wars of the period, while some also attended Parliament as Knights of the Shire. In the first half of the 17th century, the Salford Portmote records 
give a glimpse of the growing importance of textile industries in the small town. In 1608, a citizen was brought before the court for washing linen clothes under ye pomp. Cotton had been used in England in various ways for a long time, but in Lancashire it began to be used with linen wraps in the making of fustians and gradually ousted the older coarse woolens. Among a group of men rising to prominence at this time was Humphrey Booth, a merchant clothier and woolen cloth manufacturer. His name first occurs in the Salford Portmoat records in 1611. From then on, he appears frequently as a purchaser of further burgages and in various official positions, from the overseer of the pump to the most important office of Borough Reeve, which he held on six occasions. As Salford expanded on the back of the textile trade, the need for a church became more important and Humphrey Booth led a campaign to allow the citizens to build their own. In 1634, he finally got permission from the Bishop of Chester to build a chapel of ease in Salford. Sir Alexander Radcliffe of Audsall was among a group of notable townspeople who subscribed to the building costs, and the following year it was consecrated as the Chapel of Sacred Trinity. Shortly after receiving communion there for the first time, its founder, Humphrey Booth, died. As well as tending to the spiritual needs of the community, his chapel performed other, more earthly functions. The danger of fire among timber buildings was always high, and a serious fire in Manchester in 1615 had brought home to the Burgesses of Salford the fact that, due to growing congestion, tighter regulations were needed. They ordered that only one day's provisional faggots should be kept at the back of the bakehouse, the greatest source of danger in timber-built housing, and that twelve leather buckets, two hooks and two long ladders were to be purchased. The fire equipment was stored in Sacred Trinity Chapel, and the bell was used to sound the fire alarm, a practice that continued until 1835. These local concerns, though, were soon to be overshadowed by national events. When civil war broke out in 1642, Salford's loyalties were influenced by the fact that the local landowners, the Radcliffs and the Byrams of Salford, and the Stanleys in Broughton, were all strong royalists. As a result, the town had already declared for the king when the royalist Lord Strange arrived on Saturday the 24th of September, 1642, to deal with the situation in Manchester, which had sided with Parliament. Artillery stationed on the Salford bank of the Irwell pounded Manchester and a fierce battle raged on Salford Bridge. The siege dragged on for a full week until Lord Strange heard of his father's death and withdrew to take up his new title, Earl of Derby. The following month, Sir Alexander Radcliffe of Audsall was committed to the Tower of London by Parliament for assisting in the siege of Manchester. Although the casualties had been relatively light, the importance of the battle was enormous. Had Manchester fallen, the Royalists would have had complete control over Lancashire. As it was, Manchester became the parliamentary headquarters and the centre of the committee for Lancashire. At this time, the Borough Reeve of Salford was Henry Wrigley, a local cloth merchant and banker, who had begun to buy up land and so become eligible for office as a burgess. He was, however, at best a lukewarm royalist and fled to London leaving his affairs at Salford in confusion. As a consequence, when the Portmote mess in October 1644, it was discovered that, horror of horrors, he had lost the town's charter, two court books, a box of writings and certain bonds for security of the town from strangers that were in danger to be troublesome. Fortunately, he was able to find the missing papers and hand them to the incoming Borough Reeve. It's noticeable how fastidious the Port Moat became about recording the safekeeping and transfer of the charter in the following years. By 1650, the congregation of Sacred Trinity was large enough for the chapel to be elevated to a parish church. Apart from the tower, which probably dates back to the original building, the present church dates from the rebuilding of 1753. 
By the early 18th century, Salford's population stood at around two and a half thousand, still mainly concentrated within the triangle of streets near Salford Bridge, Chapel Street, Gravel Lane and Greengate. The buildings here were mainly timber-framed houses, perhaps the best known being the Bull's Head Inn in Greengate, where the popular pastime of bull baiting took place. Pendleton and Broughton at this time were still largely rural, with a combined population of around 2,000. As the century progressed, the region's textile industry, particularly the use of cotton, grew rapidly. Profits were ploughed back into the industry so that supplies of cotton wool and yarn were financed and organised by merchants and manufacturers who began to build warehouses and workshops onto their homes, gradually eroding the traditional independence of the home workers. The massive growth in the cotton trade led to merchants seeking a cheaper form of transport between Salford and Liverpool than the laborious overland route. On the 17th of June 1721, the Mersey and Irwell Act was passed, authorising the promoters to make the rivers navigable. The Mersey and Irwell navigation was fully operational by 1736, and special flat-bottomed barges, known as flats, could sail from Manchester to Runcorn. Prominent in the 1750s was the Salford Key Company, a carrying and warehousing concern with land on the Salford side of the river and bustling quays between Oldfield Road and Chapel Street. The burgeoning Industrial Revolution brought ever-increasing demands for coal and improved transport and, in 1758, Francis Egerton, 3rd Duke of Bridgewater, drew up plans for a canal to bring coal from his pits at Worsley to Manchester. When it opened in 1761, it was the first completely artificial waterway in England. It also produced one of the early wonders of the Canal Age in the shape of James Brindley's aqueduct, which took the canal over the Irwell at Barton. The effect was immediate and dramatic, with the price of coal from the Duke's pits dropping from sevenpence a hundredweight to fourpence. The canal was later extended to Runcorn, offering a more reliable route to the sea than the long, winding river navigation, and was soon competing with the Mersey Irwell Company for goods and passengers. While the Duke was building his canal, moves were also afoot to improve the region's road network. Turnpike trusts were groups who promoted a bill in Parliament to place a portion of highway in their locality under their control. They undertook to keep it in good repair in return for being able to charge users of their portion of the road. Barriers, known as turnpikes, were erected at intervals for the collection of tolls. On the 31st of October, 1752, at the instigation of coal owners who used the pack horse roads of the time, there was a meeting to consider an application to Parliament for permission to turnpike the road from Salford to Chorley. The bill was passed in 1753 to include roads spreading fanwise from Salford to Warrington, Wigan, Chorley and Bolton. The first stagecoach for mail and passengers had begun by 1770 between Salford and Liverpool. Passengers left Salford at 6am, breakfasted at Earlham, dined at Warrington, drank tea at Prescott and reached Liverpool at nightfall. A reminder of the great days of the stagecoach still exists in the shape of the old toll house on Berry New Road at Kersal. The improved roads soon showed up weaknesses in the transport network and medieval Salford bridge proved inadequate for the increased traffic. In 1776 it was widened and a few years later a new crossing to Manchester was created. In 1785 New Bailey Bridge, named after the nearby New Bailey Prison, was built downriver. The New Bailey landing stage on the Salford side of the river was the busiest spot along the boundary, being close to Salford Quay and also the spot where packet boats arrived and departed. The present Albert Bridge stands on the site, having replaced New Bailey in 1844. With a new communications network now in place, the region was set to take full advantage of the next stage of the Industrial Revolution.
The inventions of Richard Arkwright and James Watt accelerated the move into factories until the old methods of home working were a thing of the past. The steam engine led to the abandonment of country sites for new premises and towns where labour and coal were more readily available. Factories began to spring up wherever there was space, no longer restricted by the need for water power and, as mass production took hold, People flooded into the newly industrialized areas to fill the jobs available. Salford's transformation was underway. The population in 1773 was just under 5,000. Within 15 years, it was up to 7,500 and still growing rapidly. Many of the additional workers were drawn from country areas and during the same period the population of rural Broughton declined. Pendleton's population rose from 3,600 to 4,800, with workers moving to the factories set up near the coal pits, and also partly due to the township's growing popularity as a desirable residential area for businessmen. The road through Pendleton to Eccles was for years known as Millionaire's Row. Industrial development was mainly along the Owl Valley, away from the rich areas. Smoke was now beginning to pollute the atmosphere of Salford and Manchester and wealthy families moved out to the windward side of the main industrial areas. A few of their grand homes still grace the modern borough. In the 1820s, Sir Charles Barry built his mansion on Buell Hill, which in 1906 opened to the public as a natural history museum and has developed more recently as a museum of coal mining. A cheap and readily available coal supply was essential for the further development of Salford industry and the coal owners' sponsorship of the Bolton and Berry Canal resulted in the first waterborne delivery from Clifton to Windsor Bridge on the 9th of March 1794. Coal from mines at Pendleton and Agecroft was the principal traffic and some of the pitheads were so close to the waterway that coal could be loaded directly into barges and transported to the terminal wharfs at Oldfield Road. In May 1807, the Mersey and Irwell Company launched an improved passenger service to Runcorn. The packet wharf was on the Salford side of the Irwell, near New Bailey Street, where waiting rooms were built beneath the roadway. Horse-drawn, sail-assisted boats left here at 8 a.m. daily, arriving at Runcorn eight hours later, an hour less than the Bridgewater Canal service. From Runcorn, passengers could travel on to Liverpool by sailing ship. Improvements also continued to the region's road network, and from 1808, after the construction of Regent Bridge, Regent Road developed along a new turnpike route to Eccles. Both stagecoach and waterborne passenger services, though, were rendered obsolete by the onset of a new transport revolution. Since railway pioneer George Stevenson had successfully built the world's first commercial railway from Stockton to Darlington, investors had been clamouring for a piece of the action. The financial clout of Manchester's businessmen could not be denied, and in 1830, despite great difficulty in crossing Chat Moss, the world's first fully steam-powered passenger railway opened from Manchester to Liverpool. Unfortunately, the day was somewhat marred when Liverpool MP William Huskisson was killed when he fell into the path of the inaugural train, driven by Stevenson himself. Nevertheless, the railway was an immediate success. The wealthy merchants of Pendleton could set out for Liverpool in the morning, conclude their business and be back home in plenty of time for dinner. The coming of the railway to Salford also produced what has become one of the great places of pilgrimage for industrial historians. At Patrick Croft Railway Bridge, the first canal is crossed by the first passenger railway. Not surprisingly for a city containing a river, not without its dangers, Salford has had its fair share of splendid swimmers and the undoubted king was Mark Addy. Born in 1838 on the banks of the Irwell, he later rescued no fewer than 55 people from the far from pleasant waters of our river. 
He devised life-saving methods, was awarded both gold and silver medals, the rare Albert Medal, and after his marriage he became mine host at the old boathouse inn. He made his last rescue on Whit Monday, 1889, but the filthy water he swallowed led to his death shortly afterwards. Meanwhile, to fuel the industrial fire, a river of migrants poured into this boom town. By 1851, its population was approaching 90,000, with the largest single group from Ireland. In fact, when the Catholic Church re-established its diocese in the 19th century, it created the See of Salford, not Manchester. Greed and insensitivity epitomized the attitudes towards housing these newcomers and the slums around Greengate, containing the black and putrid stream of human misery, were dismissed as an unchangeable social fact. But if it was easy to overlook the slums around the corner, some effects of the grinding poverty couldn't be ignored. Street Arabs were ragged, barefoot children who played, begged, lived and died in Salford streets. The appalling conditions gave Salford the highest infant mortality rate in the country and made the entire area little better than a valley of death. Pollution from hundreds of factory chimneys created air so sulfurous the jewellery cleaned one day was the next like brass, tarnished green. This then was the loss of the vast majority of migrants who came in search of fortune. But a handful of individuals did rise from the mire. Elkina Armitage, a poor boy from Failsworth, founded a great textile firm based at Pendleton New Mills, became mayor of Manchester and received a knighthood from Queen Victoria. Richard Howarth was born in 1820 to a poor family and by the age of 13 had left school to work full-time in a cotton mill. There he attended night school, showing mathematical ability, and was transferred to Fustian checking and accounting. At 14 he was privately buying and selling fence, becoming a bookkeeper at a Bolton mill five years later. Moving to a Manchester warehouse, he again did some personal trading. By the age of 32 he had amassed capital capital of £5,000 and joined with Messrs. Holton and Craven as yarn and cloth commission agents in Cannon Street. Manufacturing was small scale until the trio rented Broughton Bridge Mills, where spinning was added to weaving. In 1864, the firm began the Great Aldsall Expansion, building Egerton Mill and Shed. Tatton Mill and Shed were added in 1870 and Aldsall Shed in 1872. At their peak, the mills covered 13 acres, containing 150,000 spindles and 4,000 looms, and employed 4,000 workers. From the most humble of beginnings, Dickie Howarth became synonymous with Audsall. While Howarth's empire was expanding, the government of Salford changed radically. In 1844, the town became a municipal borough, ruled by a 32-man council from Salford Township, and a ten-member board of guardians for Pendlebury. Pendleton and Broughton, though, home to many a wealthy merchant, refused to join. Separated from Salford by the Irwell and linked by few bridges, Broughtonians liked to think of themselves as the west end of Manchester, and both townships were concerned that joining the borough would see them paying for the poor of Salford. In 1846, the new council made their first lasting mark on the community. Lark Hill Estate on the banks of the Irwell was purchased by public subscription and opened as a park for the enjoyment and recreation of the public. Sir Robert Peel had been a prominent figure in the campaign for public parks and had himself contributed to the subscription fund. So, when the estate officially opened in August 1846, it was named Peel Park in his honour. The following year saw nearly 200 years of horse racing on Kersal Moor come to an end when a new course was opened at Castle Irwell, where, apart from a 30-year stint at Manchester Racecourse, 
racing survived until 1963. The first record of racing on the moor, dated September the 1st, 1681, tells of a strange unheard of race on Carsey Moor, and an advert in the London Gazette of May the 2nd to 5th, 1687, describes racing on Castle Moor. On January the 9th, 1850, Salford made history when the first unconditionally free municipal public library in the entire United Kingdom opened in the Mansion House in Peel Park, mainly due to the foresight of Joseph Brotherton, Salford's first MP. Its establishment preempted the Public Libraries Act by seven months. In 1853, Pendleton and Broughton finally joined the municipal borough concluding that it was better than the threat of control by the county magistrates. Even so, the conflict of interests between the different factions of the new borough made decision-making a complicated, often impossible task, a situation highlighted by the Property Owners Protection Association. Founded in the 1870s to protect the interests of poor property owners, mainly slum landlords and jerry builders, they were, for years, a major reason for the Council's failure to enforce a stringent set of building regulations. Not only were the inhabitants of Old Salford condemned to inferior housing, they also had to deal with the open sewer that was the encircling River Irwell, polluted not only by Salford, but also the 159 towns and villages in the valley above. The undrained and unsewered town had fallen foul of the Lancashire curse, the prevalence of the Midden system. A report of 1871 noted, We have some 15,000 heaps of decaying miasmic matter exposed to wind, rain and heat in the borough. By 1875, Regent Road Workhouse housed 800 inmates with a staff of 50 including a bandmaster, as orphan boys who learned instruments were snapped up by military regiments. In 1882, the hospital functions of the workhouse were removed to the new Poor Law Infirmary on Eccles Old Road, which still serves Salford as Hope Hospital. In the 16th century, Leyland described Salford as a suburb to Manchester. Three hundred years later, even Salfordians were forced to quietly admit that their town was the mere lapel of her great neighbour, and to outsiders the two were indistinguishable. Salford had no obvious centre, and lacked many commercial, social and cultural institutions found in towns of a similar size, relying on those across the sludge. No surprise then, that although the greatest canal engineering project of the century wound up in Salford, it was called the Manchester Ship Canal. After the Clyde in Glasgow was made navigable to ocean-going ships, the idea of improving the neglected Mersey and Irwell navigation took hold and a committee was formed. In March 1883, the first plan was described. The Manchester Ship Canal is estimated to cost between £5 million and £6 million, and engineers believe that the work could be finished in four years. The rivers Irwell and Mersey would be partly utilised for the new canal, which will join the estuary of the Mersey at Runcorn. Parliamentary bills were prepared, and under fierce opposition from Liverpool, who stood to lose a lot of revenue, two were defeated, but a third, modified bill was passed. On the 4th of July 1887, the first real steps were taken when the Bridgewater Navigation Company, which included the rights to the Mersey and Irwell navigation, was bought for £1,710,000. Just over four months later, the first sod was cut by Lord Egerton of Tatton, and work began. 16,000 men and boys, most from other parts of England and Ireland, were employed in its construction and mostly housed in timber settlements at Marshville, Acton Grange and Eastham. These areas, with mission halls and tea rooms provided by Thomas Walker, the contractor, were suggestive at first glance of early times in a new country. The first aid posts and hospitals along the route were well used, 
Over 130 men were killed and over 1,000 injured. Permanently disabled men were re-employed as watchmen and caretakers, known as Walker's Fragments. In 1889, Thomas Walker died, and work was taken over by the ship Canal Company. And by 1890, a series of setbacks left the company starved for cash. Salford Council offered a loan of a million pounds, but Manchester, in return for a large share in the project, offered two million, which was eagerly accepted. With that, the canal's future was secured and construction continued, wherever possible following the course of the old Mersey Irwell navigation, which was deepened and widened, finally entering the Mersey estuary at Eastham. At Mode Wheel, the mill and the weir that powered it were demolished, and the old Barton aqueduct that carried the Bridgewater Canal over the Irwell was replaced by a swing bridge. On New Year's Day, 1894, the Norsemen led a procession of 71 ships to the Salford Terminus, and when Queen Victoria officially opened the canal on the 21st of May, she knighted the mayors of both Salford and Manchester. Manchester may have claimed the ship canal, but, with a strange twist of irony, in the same year work started on the Big Ditch. A child was born in Stretford, Manchester, that Salford would later make its own. Lawrence Stephen Lowry moved to Salford in his twenties, and as a rent collector got to know the poorer districts and people that inspired many of his works. He himself said, I'll always be grateful to rent collection, I put many of the tenants in my pictures. Trade on the canal was initially slow, but following the creation of Trafford Park, the world's first industrial estate, ships gliding through Salford fields became a regular sight. Within a few years, Salford had risen to become the fourth busiest port in the country. The original Trafford Road docks were unable to cope with the volume of traffic, and new facilities were built on the site of Manchester Racecourse. Four years later, in 1905, a new dock, the half-mile-long number 9, was officially opened by King Edward VII. The thousands of sailors that flooded into Salford saw pubs and hotels do a roaring trade, like the much-frequented Clowes Hotel on Trafford Road. The advent of World War I galvanized Salford's industries to the war effort and also brought home some of the horrors of the Western Front. As the number of casualties mounted, wounded were accommodated in public buildings like Langworthy Road and Tootle Road schools. The post-war land fit for heroes never came to pass amidst the prolonged depression of the interwar years. Hard times for the poor of recession hit Salford. Nevertheless, some important steps were taken. A tuberculosis sanitarium opened at Marple in 1923, and in 1931, a camp for poor Salford children opened on the Welsh coast. In 1926, the borough of Salford became the city of Salford, although a year later the new city shrank. Part of Great Clow Street disappeared when a section of the cliff, where the Irwell undercuts the high ground, collapsed into the river. As well as threats too, there were some developments of housing in this period. In 1930, the extremely run-down Greengate was declared a clearance area although most of the slums remained until after 1945. During the 1930s, the Depression continued to claim victims in the city. 700 coal miners from Pendleton Pit joined the ranks of the unemployed when the deepest pit in the country, at 3,500 feet, closed. The once dominant textile industry also began to falter, and, gradually, some factories and mills faced closure. But the build-up to the Second World War saw industry once again thrive, and the regained prosperity was evident in at least one of Salford's new buildings.
Swinton Town Hall, completed in 1938, stood on the site of the local industrial school, opened in 1843 to train poor children, an alternative to the workhouse. Salford and Manchester's innumerable industries made them an obvious target for the Luftwaffe, and air raids became an all too frequent fact of life. When the war ended and the celebrations were over, it was time to take stock, and for the people of Salford, things looked pretty grim. Housing that was already run down deteriorated still further during the war when there was no new building, and German bombs devastated a large part of the city. Drastic action was called for. A famous song of the time foresaw what needed to be done. I'm going to make a good sharp axe, sharp and steel tempered in the fire. We'll chop you down like an old dead tree. Dirty old town. Prophetic words in view of the council's actions. Huge swathes of slum housing were demolished, starting with the older areas in Oldfield Road and behind the town hall. Scores of Salford residents were rehoused in new council estates. More and more of Salford was swept away as the axe continued to fall and the tower blocks rose. In the space of 25 years, Victorian Salford vanished. With it went the legacy of those times. The respiratory diseases that were widespread in the city were combated with the first smokeless zones at Fairhope and Ladywell. In a remarkable turnaround, Salford was later awarded the Arnold Marsh Clean Air Award. The 50s were also the Docks' heyday. In 1955, 56 and 59, the port handled over 18 million tons of cargo and employed up to 3,000 people. Salford had trade links with over 140 ports throughout the world and maintained regular sailings to Canada and North America but the end was in sight. 1974 saw local boundaries throughout the country change and Salford was no exception. The city grew into Salford Metropolitan District incorporating the districts of Eccles, Worsley, Swinton, Pendlebury and Earlham. Earlham Steelworks fortunes had, since its foundation, been inextricably linked to the ship canals and the closure of the works in 1979 capped off a period of industrial decline that was the death of the Salford docks. Although trade was still plied on the ship canal's lower reaches, it was decided that the docks were commercially unviable, and they formally closed in 1982. After a few years, the realisation dawned that shipping really wasn't going to return, and the begging question was, what to do with the abandoned and derelict site. In 1985, plans were published for the development of Salford Keys, where, it was hoped, a new quarter to the city could be created, attracting investment to the once thriving area. The old port buildings were demolished, leaving a clean slate for the partnership of Salford City Council, central government and private developers to work on. From the wasteland sprang attractive new housing and smart bases for numerous businesses. The old docks were separated from their former lifeblood, and new smaller channels now link up with the ship canal, providing clean water basins that locals certainly make the most of. Tree-lined promenades give the area a continental feel and bring a little greenery to the city. By 1994, Around 1,500 trees had been planted. The whole development has recently been capped 
by the impressive centre named after Salford's most famous son, a specially built home to the arts. The futuristic building incorporates two theatres, restaurants and bars, contemporary art exhibitions and, of course, a display dedicated to Lowry himself. The money that's flooding into Salford has largely been confined to a few development corridors, like the Ship Canal and Chapel Street, and, with some exceptions, hasn't really filtered to the majority of people. The Council's unitary development plan hopes to change that, regenerating the whole city. It's essentially the plan of action for Salford up to the year 2016, and aims to create the best possible quality of life for the people of Salford. New shoots are sprouting from the stump of the old dead tree. If it continues to bloom, hopefully everyone here will savour its fruit 